so viruses have had a great uh, impact on human history and uh, been involved in a lot of uh, important changes within the world. And now I draw your attention to this yellow guy over here, um, which is smallpox. And there was one particular outbreak that was really bad, which was in 1520, where smallpox killed 56 million people and amongst those 90% of all Native Americans. So you can see there that smallpox didn't kill as many people as the bubonic plague. However, if you don't look at the singular biggest outbreak, but you look at how many people have died from a certain virus over time, um, the numbers look quite different. So you can see here, this is which viruses have killed over time the most amount of people. And the biggest culprit over here is smallpox. So you can see here that smallpox during the time of its existence would have killed over 300 million people. Some estimates even go as far as 500 million. And the reason for that is, is that smallpox have, has been around for a really long time. Smallpox, uh, people have suffered from smallpox from 10,000 BC onwards uh, up to 1979. And perhaps even earlier, we just don't have any evidence for any earlier infections yet. Um, However, interestingly, if you are quite young, you may not even know about smallpox. Uh, and the reason for that we get to in a minute. For now, if there is any members of the audience that are over the age of uh, 55, uh, if you have any time during the talk, I would like for you to check out your arms. Um, so your upper arms in around this region or in, in that region, depending if you're left or right-handed and see if you have a small circular scar there. And uh, if you do, if you remember why you have it, and if you don't, I will tell you a bit later. So moving on to smallpox, uh, because some of you may not remember it, uh, or you may have been born, most likely you've been born after smallpox didn't exist anymore. So smallpox um, is a virus or is an infectious disease, uh, which is characterized by lesions that are covering your entire body. So you can see here, this is the um, at the bottom, you can see the arm of a small child, and you can see these blisters all over the arm. And these blisters contain infectious virus particles. And over the course of infection, these scabs or these blisters will harden into scabs that also still contain infectious virus. And if the person survives the infection, they will eventually uh, uh, heal off, but they will often leave scars on your skin. This is a somewhat, I mean, it is of course still severe, but it is a much milder case compared to some that you can see or that has, have been observed in histories. So for example, over here, you can see uh, the hands of and uh, feet of a person that are basically completely covered in smallpox lesions. And all of these lesions are filled with infectious virus. And the infectious virus that is in the millions in every single lesion of these is this little guy over here. This is a microscopy image of variola virus or the virus that causes smallpox, which has a very interesting shape. It's kind of egg shaped and it has like a dumbbell shaped core in which the genetic information, the DNA of the virus is in. And on the sides, uh, there are two structures that are called lateral bodies that have a lot of immune modulatory uh, proteins in it that will basically uh, manipulate the host. And uh, yeah, pox infections have been around for a really long time. So over here, I hope this is not too gruesome for some people to look at. Um, this is the mummified remains of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses V, who died uh, 11, uh, 1145 before Christ. And you can see on his, uh, you can see on his skin over here, this round lesion, for example. This is actually a scar from a pox infection and people have been able to uh, extract DNA from it and they sequenced it and they could find that this pharaoh was at the time of death infected with an ancestor of variola virus. So you can see over 3000 years ago, people have already been infected with uh, pox viruses. However, so this virus has been around for a really long time. It unfortunately killed a lot of people, but then in 1980, this happened. The World Health Organization declared smallpox as eradicated. There were no more smallpox cases anywhere in the world, um, which is of course very surprising given how big of an impact the virus had. And uh, you may now wonder how was that possible? And now we get into the history of vaccination with that. 
So because smallpox was such a dangerous and severe disease, people have been experimenting with vaccination for a long, long time. Uh, so in India and China and other parts of Asia, there was actually a practice by which um, people who had these blisters and lesions on the skin would be searched out and they would, the uh, lesions would be taken and basically um, scraped off and people would either try to inhale them, swallow them, or they would be scratched into people's skin uh, in the hopes that that could protect you from a much more severe pox infection. And that this has already happened 200 BC. In Europe, that wasn't known for a really long time. However, one of the biggest early advocates of, infection, uh, of vaccination was this woman over here, which is Lady Mary Watley Montagu. And she was an English aristocrat, white writer and poet, and she was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey. And when she moved to Turkey with her husband, uh, she was exposed to what the Turkish people did because they also tested out in, uh, vaccination procedures. And when she returned to uh, the UK, she did a great job at advocating for vaccinations to the point where she had her own child vaccinated and she even convinced King George to vaccinate his son. And uh, how vaccinations were done at the time was that a pox was taken as a lesion from a previously vaccinated child. Um, and that was then injected into other children. However, because you took these scabs from other people, there was a risk of cross-contamination with other viruses. So the problem with that was that often this would cause syphilis because a child that had syphilis that you would take the scar from, or that you would take the scab from, of course, would possibly transfer this to the next child that was going to get vaccinated. In addition to that, the risk of death from this method was one in 180. So you may be a bit apprehensive of vaccinating your child if this fairly high mortality rate might occur. Uh -huh. um, by the way, aside from that, she was uh, also a very important writer. She wrote one of the most, uh, of one of the first secular writings about the Middle East. And this painting of her, she's currently laughing at a man who confessed his love to her. Uh, which somehow somebody decided to uh, capture in a painting. So she must have been great fun at parties. Okay, now, of course, the uh, in risk of death of one in 180 is not very appealing for vaccinations. So there seemed, must have been a better option. And uh, you may have heard of Edward Jenner. He was a British um, physician. And what he observed uh, during his work as a medical professional was that cows also had some sort of pox lesions and I unfortunately couldn't get a good picture of it but here's a painting and you can see that these lesions look somewhat similar to the ones of the child that had smallpox infections so it might be that these two so he thought maybe these two are related and in addition to that milkmaids so the woman that would milk the cows often had lesions that looked very similar to the cowpox and these women seem to rarely ever get sick of uh, smallpox infections. And they were actually then recruited to serve in hospitals to take care of pox infected people. Um, so what he then thought is maybe these women contracted the cowpox virus so that they wouldn't get sick of smallpox anymore. And with that, an idea was born and he then basically infected the son of one of the milkmaids with the cowpox virus. He waited for a few weeks and then he exposed the child to the real smallpox infections and waited whether the child would get sick or not. I should say that is not how virologists do experiments anymore these days because, um, well, it's not quite ethical, but it worked out. The boy lived and with that, the first vaccination in history was born um, and that was in 1796. Now, since then, um, we've improved a great deal and a lot more, oh, sorry, we've improved a great deal and his idea caught on and uh, the WHO eventually took on to vaccinate everybody in the world. And uh, what was used to vaccinate people was vaccinia virus. Vaccinia means Latin, in Latin means from the cow. And you can see this is a vaccinia virus image. This is the smallpox image. They look very, very similar. They have both this 
a dumbbell shaped core. And not only do they look similar, their DNA se sequence is very identical at 96%. And that is why infection with vaccinia virus gives you, gives you immunity against smallpox. And then later on in time, um, this is why I wanted to ask you earlier about whether you have a lesion or not, because with vaccinia infections, this is kind of how it looks like. So you would get uh, an injection site, and in this injection site, you get one uh, pox lesion forming, but it doesn't spread across your body and it doesn't cause you any other harm. And this will eventually also harden and eventually fall off, and it might leave a scar or it might not. Uh, so if you still have one, that means you're vaccinated as a child. If you don't have one, doesn't mean you weren't vaccinated, but maybe your skin just healed better. So this idea of vaccination was so successful that eventually uh, some countries even mandated vaccination. With that, Bavaria was the first place in the world to ever mandate vaccination in 1807. Other places in Germany followed suit. Um, so parents that wouldn't vaccinate their children were fined. Prussia did not uh, fine people, but they only allowed children into school or into job training if they could show proof of vaccination, which may remind some people of the current regulations in terms of measles vaccination, because now children are only admitted to go to school if they have been vac vaccinated against measles. West Germany abandoned all mandated vaccinations in 1984. However, of course, uh, in 2019, this measles vaccination rule was reintroduced. Okay, so we've come quite a long way since uh, Edward Jenner, because since then, a lot more people have done research towards vaccines for different viruses and other pathogens. I'm going to list a few. Uh, I can't list all because then I would bore you for about 72 hours. But let's start with Valdemar Hafkin. Um, in, the in the 1890s, he tested out pest vaccine trials. Unfortunately, they failed because his vaccine was contaminated with tetanus which means that the people that he injected eventually fell ill and partly died from tetanus infections. So there have been setbacks in, virus, uh, in vaccine developments in the past. Um, more successfully, you probably know this guy, Louis Pasteur. He also founded an institute that he named after himself, and he was the first person to successfully treat a child infected with rabies. And uh, how that happened is he'd been researching rabies for a really long time. And he had actually uh, tested vaccinations on his dogs. So he had injected the dogs with a solution that he obtained from the spinal cord of a rabbit that died from rabies. And then he exposed the dogs to the rabies virus and they wouldn't fall ill anymore. And when a little child was brought to him, an eight-year-old boy that had been bitten by a dog that had rabies, he uh, did a similar thing. He injected the boy with a solution made of a rabbit brain that was from uh, a rabbit that died from rabies over the course of several days. And the child never developed any rabies symptoms and didn't pass away from the virus. I should mention on that note, uh, Louis Pasteur actually failed his first bachelor's degree in biology. So anybody who's struggling with their grades, uh, there's still hope. You can still save the world from infectious diseases. Um, next up, uh, Wilhelm Kolle. He uh, was the first one to develop heat inactivated cholera vaccines in 1896. Um, then we've got Ernst Lederle. He uh, developed a diphtheria toxin. And then these two, Albert Calmet and Camille Gurin, they were the first ones to develop a TB vaccine, so a TB light vaccine in the 1920s. And uh, Albert Sabine, he was the one who developed the oral vaccine against polio virus. So some people in the German audience who may be a bit older or who saw this in history classes might know this poster, which is Schluckimpfung ist süß, Kinderlähmung ist grausam, which means um, vaccination is sweet, uh, polio myelitis is gruesome. And that comes from when this oral vaccine was developed, the drops would put would be put on a piece of sugar and it would be fed to the children and then they wouldn't fall ill from poliovirus infection. And lastly, there were lots more in the middle, but I wanted to have one picture in color in here. Um, so these are Drew Weissman and Katalin Carico. And uh, they, amongst many others, were absolutely crucial for the development of the mRNA vaccines. 
So this would be, uh, for example, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine against uh, SARS-CoV-2, because they, in 2005, developed a de delivery method for mRNA to enter the cells, which was something that scientists previously had struggled with immensely. And with all of these amazing vaccines on the market, uh, the WHO estimates that vaccines currently prevent between two and three million deaths per year. And that was an estimate that they did before the coronavirus pandemic hit. So it might be even more in nowadays, in a year's time, in two years time, and hopefully most of the planet has had access to vaccines. Now moving on to, as I said, there's good viruses. And I want to convince you that there's good viruses. So we'll talk a little bit about the virus that I worked on, which is vaccinia virus. So the virus that was basically used to eradicate the deadliest virus that we ever had on the face of the earth. Um, this picture probably looks a bit messy to people who aren't used to this type of microscopy. So I hope you'll, you'll, you'll understand it with a bit of explanation. So this is a cell uh, of a body that is infected with virus particles. And you can see here how different virus particles are being formed. So the red portions is basically the beginning of the formation of a variant. Then you've got the blue stage, sort of the round viruses in which uh, the DNA is being put and they are being assembled to eventually these green ones on top where you can see these basically look like ready-made viruses and they are very close to the surface of the cell so that they can escape and infect more cells. Um, so basically, you can see that in this cell, there's a lot of variants, and you would think, why doesn't the cell do something against it? Wouldn't it be in the cell's interest to stop all of this infection happening? And you would be right. However, a vaccine virus does have a lot of tricks up its non-existent sleeve to uh, circumvent immunity. So this is what I did research on my, myself, on how vaccine virus tricks the immune response. And one thing I looked at is autophagy. And autophagy is a cellular process that means self-eating, which sounds quite gruesome, but it is actually very practical. So self-eating or autophagy is a process that's sort of like a recycling process in a cell. So any proteins that the cell doesn't like or need anymore, um, it kind of encapsulates in a membrane and in which those get degraded, those proteins, and they can be used as building blocks for something else. And not only does it use, does the cell use this process for recycling, but also to get rid of pathogens. So if a virus comes in, the cell recognizes bad virus, it goes into one of these vesicles, into these structures, and there it gets degraded. And of course, then it can't infect the cell anymore. So when vaccinia comes into the cell, of course, the cell recognizes this is not something that I like. Uh, I'm going to try to get rid of it using autophagy. So one of the very important proteins in here is P62. It's one of the key proteins in autophagy. What exactly it does doesn't, doesn't matter so much. But basically, here comes vaccinia virus trying to fend our little Darth Vader vaccinia virus off. Um, however, that doesn't work so well because vaccinia virus also has a trick. Vaccinia virus changes the protein P62 in a way where it modulates it so that the protein itself has no other choice than to go into the nucleus of the cell, so where the DNA sits. And this is something then the protein is pretty much trapped in the nucleus, it can't go anywhere and it can't do autophagy because autophagy happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. And then vaccinia has the cytoplasm of the cell for itself and can happily replicate however it pleases. Of course, when you look at it under the microscope, it doesn't look as nice with Darth Vader and light swords, even though that would be really cool. Um, so what I see when I look at a microscope is something like this. These are microscopy images where you can see this is a cell, um, a human cell, and you can see here the blue part is the nucleus, so where the DNA sits. This is the cytoplasm part, which is pretty green because the P62 protein I have stained in green. And this is the uninfected condition. Now when P62, um, now when vaccinia virus comes in, P62 tries to attack the virus. So it kind of tries to form little clumps around the invading virus and tries to fight, fight it off in that way. However, four hours after infection, 
you can see that a lot of these cells that are infected, you can see all of this green P62 sitting in the nucleus being pretty much useless for the immune defense. And there's a lot of other modulations that vaccinia does to the immune response, but I'm not going to mention those as this was kind of like the main part that I studied during infection uh, during my PhD. And uh, also there is a lot of other immune responses that vaccinia also modulates um, that other people have done really interesting work on. Now, as I said, um, there's good viruses out there, one of them being vaccinia because we were able to eradicate smallpox with it. But I thought I'd give you two more examples. One of them is adenoviruses. Adenoviruses are currently being studied by researchers to uh, use as a delivery vehicle, sort of, to get foreign DNA into cells. And uh, why we want to do that is because there is a lot of diseases that we think we can cure with it. So what is currently being researched is to kind of um, deliver DNA to kind of make immune cells more active, to train cells against invading pathogens. So for example, the, uh, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a vaccine that works with gene delivery by a virus, or there's also in the works immune therapy against cancer or against autoimmune disease. And also in the middle, we've got a bacteriophage. This one looks very interesting. I think it's the coolest looking virus that we know of at the moment. Um, and this is a virus that only infects bacteria. Of course, that is very interesting for us because you may know that many uh, diseases that are caused by bacteria, a lot of antibiotics don't work anymore because they've been overprescribed and we kind of run out of good antibiotics. So uh, what is now being studied is if we can use bacteriophages against human diseases caused by bacteria. And another thing that is being investigated is, um, you may know about the CRISPR system. CRISPR got the Nobel Prize uh, just a couple of months ago because it's a really exciting genome editing tool that uh, will probably be of huge help for lots of uh, disease uh, research and many other applications. And CRISPR is a defense system by bacteria to get rid of bacterial DNA in the cell. So without the bacteriophage, we wouldn't have CRISPR. And lastly, so this is um, by the Fauci article I mentioned a lot earlier, um, epidemics are happening at any given point. I think in Europe, we're just quite lucky that we don't have to deal with as many of them um, at any given point. So it might seem that this is a very exceptional situation that we're in at the moment. But if you look at other places on earth, there's constantly epidemics emerging anywhere. You've got the Ebola virus epidemic from 2015, you had SARS-1 and MERS, you had the Zika virus uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, that is of course very sad and very unfortunate, but at least we are much better prepared at the moment than we ever were. And uh, this is something that I sneaked uh, from the Moderna website. So, this is something that I would like to highlight the entire development of the mRNA vaccines that are on the market now and other vaccines as well have happened incredibly quickly. And that is because we have so much more research and science to prepare vaccines much quicker. And one thing that is very impressive is, so on January 10th last year, the coronavirus sequence was published. So what the genetic information of the virus is. And only three days later, Moderna had already developed the mRNA sequence that was then used in the actual Moderna vaccine. And everything after that was clinical trials that took, of course, quite a few months. But the actual development of the, in, of the vaccine was pretty much three days. So yeah, science makes great progress and we are better prepared than we ever were. And lastly, next time you eat a beef steak, think about this animal helped us eradicate the deadliest virus that ever existed. And maybe say thank you. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm taking any questions if you have some.